In the winter of 2012, Riot Games announced the creation of the North American League Championship Series. Many players on top of the solo queue ladder sprung into action as an opportunity arose for them to achieve their dreams of becoming a paid professional player. One person in particular, Lotta Mortis, would gather friends from solo queue and form a team to compete in the qualifiers. This team would make that dream come true and be a part of the inaugural North American LCS Spring Season. My name is Kudo, and today we look at the history of complexity gaming in the North American LCS. Made it to team number seven. Yeah, made it indeed. You can see what it means to these guys. They are now into season three. They are joining the lights of COG, TSM, Dignitas, Fear, Curse, and Good Game University. And they are now in. In preseason 3, Lotta Mortis formed a team to compete in the qualifiers for the new LCS. After his former team, Team Legion, disbanded in October, he only had one month to gather for other players and test their luck. What was the name of this team? She said she was Level 18. I am dead serious when I say that. She said she was Level 18 was formed in December to compete in the MLG qualifier for season 3 in the same month. In the first stage of the qualifiers, the top three teams out of the 32 participating would advance and fly out to Los Angeles for the main qualifier stage in the new LCS studio. She said she was Level 18's roster consisted of Nick Wu in the top lane, Lotta Mortis in the jungle, Trooper in the mid lane, Brunch Yu as the AD carry, and LEB as the support. She said she was Level 18 dominated the MLG qualifiers, placing third overall and was flown to Los Angeles. However, Riot forced she said she was Level 18 to change their team name because of how risque it was. So Lotta Mortis came up with the Brunch Club. In the main qualifiers, the Brunch Club once again had a strong showing. The team qualified into the LCS after beating out Team Marn in a best of three. Throughout the qualifiers, the Brunch Club consistently had a superior laning phase as well as a strong pick and ban phase. In game one out of the best of three, Chipper obtained a pentakill. Get out of dodge when he shows. There's the flash ult. There's the crescendo. It's Echo. It's going to be the target. Echo, you have to use the zone. He's hourglass. Nick Wu gets dropped straight away. There goes Echo as well. He managed to get taken down. Leaping across there. Chipper gets one. Gets two. Leaps back across. Gets atomic as well. Ooh, all over the shot. They're diving in. He's got the quadra. Can he get the penta? He needs to try and find Mega Zero. He's but Mega spotted. Zero they is hiding. Him. He's spotted him. He's just a good pentakill. Comes out from Chupa and he just leaps across once again, just because he can. Overall, this roster showed dominance throughout the qualifiers and seemed ready to go into the LCS. It was a dream come true to the entire team considering most of this roster would quit their jobs for this. Not only do they have a salary for playing video games from Riot, but they will also live in a gaming house. During this period, LEP changed his name to MIA. He changed his name because he was tired of being confused as a female. On a side note, the name references the fact that MIA has a prosthetic eye. It, it's 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 great. So like, I mean, MIA. Okay, yeah, MIA is a term in League of Legends. That's fine. But actually, he's got a, a prosthetic eye. Mm -hmm. So MIA missing in action, and then the eye is actually the word eye, and it's it's just it works on a lot of levels. It works. <laughs> it works. And I was like, I, I didn't know the context at first, and then one of the players told me about it. And I was like. It went from like being the worst name in LCS to the best name in LCS, uh -huh. just with that little bit of context. First you're like, oh, okay, he spelled I instead of putting an I. But yeah. yeah. No, it's, it's the meta stuff, man. <laughs> On February 2nd, 2013, Complexity Gaming would purchase the Brunch Club and be the main sponsor for the team. Complexity has been a notable gaming organization in the last decade. They had success all over the esports industry, including games such as Counter-Strike Source, Heroes of New Earth, and Call of Duty. With a reputable organization behind the team and Lotta Mortis leading the way with proven success in the qualifiers, it seemed like Complexity was going to make an impact in the LCS. However, things would be much different and exponentially more difficult in the professional stage. In the inaugural LCS season, there were two types of teams that were participating. One type was the veteran teams that had made a name for themselves in the scene. These titans of the LCS are Team Dignitas, Team Solo Mid, Counter Logic Gaming, and Team Curse. The other type of teams were the ones whose roster only solidified a couple of months before the qualifiers. Those teams are Team Marn, Good Game University, Team Vulcan, and Complexity Gaming. The difference between these two types are significant. The veteran teams have more experience, more chemistry, and overall more confidence in their play. The roster has been together for longer than a year in most cases. The newer teams only had two to three months of being together when the LCS started, and during that time, each player had to restructure their entire lives and move to gaming houses in the Los Angeles area. Also note that this was the first time for most players on these newer teams to be exposed to the entire community. The nerves of being in the public eye can be a factor, especially when MLG Dallas was Week 5's venue. 
It goes without saying, but when you compare the newer teams to the veteran teams and how they play and communicate, there was a huge advantage for the experienced rosters. This would show throughout Complexity Gaming's performance in the first half of the LCS Spring Split. We begin at Complexity Gaming's first impression in the LCS against Team Curse in Week 2. Already in Champion Select were there questions raised by the casters in the community. Complexity picked a Soraka when Miss Fortune, who at the time had Grievous Wounds built into her W, was already revealed by Curse. The early game was back and forth, Lotta Mortis was able to sneak a very early dragon twice. First Blood went to Curse when Voiboy killed Nick Wu in the top lane. However, for the rest of the game, Complexity made several mechanical and positioning errors that sealed the game for Curse. Multiple teamfights that Team Curse engaged were because of positioning errors in Complexity. Lotta Mortis was criticized heavily for his performance on Vi, consistently missing his Vault Breaker when he tried to gank. Lotta Mortis also made a critical error in the late game by engaging onto a Baron buffed Team Curse. Okay. Lotta Mortis off on the side, they get the silence, he's gonna go in, look at the damage to the Jackie, and he's gonna go in completely, a lot of burst, but look at Lotta Mortis getting shredded apart, there's the dash from uh, Hecarim as well, and Nick Wu completely eviscerated as well. Overall, Complexity did not show a good first impression to the community, and the mediocrity would only be exacerbated for the rest of the first half of the spring split. At halfway through the season, Complexity Gaming was in last place, with only one win and eight losses. The team suffered from the inability to exit the early game with the lead as well as each teammate making significant positioning and laning mistakes that allowed their opponent to snowball. In almost every loss, Complexity's lanes were losing in the early game from sheer outplay by their opponents as well as jungler aggression. These games would end up being stomps. Two significant ones were by Team Vulcan and Team Dignitas. The bot lane of Team Vulcan was able to secure three kills five minutes into the game. Heal up, Brunch you. There comes the Pulverize, they might get a kill! They could go onto this, a great exhaust, but it's not gonna be enough, it's gonna be way too quick! A double kill, no! One and one for Muffin, Cutie, and Zuna. And have it, and that's why they're being so aggressive, but now they know he has no flash, and here they come! And he actually doesn't even wait a few seconds, they go instantly back in, MIA gets back to lane and finds himself going down. At the end, Complexity did not get a single killer objective. Against Team Dignitas, Crumb snowballed all lanes so hard in the early game that they were able to end the match before Complexity had a chance to surrender. There are some games in these losses where Complexity helped their own in the middle to late game. The goal lead was relatively even and the game came down to a single teamfight. However, Complexity and the newer teams have one disadvantage. They have trouble closing out matches in the middle to late game. The middle and late game will always favor the more experienced teams. One particular example of this was in Team Solo Mid vs Complexity in Week 6. TSM benched Chaos during this week in favor of the unproven substitute Wild Turtle. 27 minutes in, Complexity took control of the game after obtaining Baron and acing TSM immediately afterwards. Here comes Dyrus acing a hold on towards Brent Shu, he's gonna go down, but the Baron's already dropped, can they turn it around this one? Lattimore has still got his ultimate available, remember Curse of the Sad Mommy, but they are all pinned in the Baron pin! Chupa does manage to get the move for, Curse of the Sad Mommy goes down, where is Nick Wu going? It's Reginald they're gonna target, Chupa gets him down, but Nick Wu is dropped, he managed to get Wild Turtle down! It is TSM dropping like flies right now, it's a double kill for Nick Wu! It's a triple kill for Nick Wu, and that is an ace for Complexity! This put Complexity in a really good position. They were able to split push and take out most of the inner and outer turrets. However, they made a critical error when Baron spawned again. Dyrus, Reginald, and Wild Turtle went to split push and take the inhibitor turrets while Complexity was doing Baron. Even though Complexity killed the odd one, they were very slow in taking this Baron because Nick Wu had to recall to save the base. Once Complexity took Baron, the middle and bot lane inhibitors were gone. This exchange would favor TSM if Complexity didn't answer back immediately, so the team attempted to. However, when Complexity answered back with a mid inhibitor, Chupra and MIA went to take the bot lane turret while Autumn Mortis and Brunchu disengaged. Reginald punished this mistake by Complexity and TSM would regain map control. They want to finish it off, you can see he's going to put the shield down, they've stretched him across too much, and here comes Reginald, he gets the stun card, but Chupa pops on his hourglass straight away, Brunchu is there. There. The rest of the team gonna go crescendo on towards Chupa. Nick Wu running in. They turn on towards Reginald. He's used the Zonia's Hourglass just at the right time. Louder Mortis around there at the moment. Hasn't got Curse of the Sad Mommy available. Reginald's solo. Here comes Nick Wu. He's gonna join the fight just as Brunchu comes in there. But Wild Turtle turned it around. He's picked up a triple kill for his team. Goes for the ace and a hole on Brunchu. Doesn't land it. But what a great turnaround from Team Solo Mid. In the next Baron spawn, Complexity would engage TSM, but Lotta Mortis was unable to steal away the Baron. Complexity lost three members and a mid inhibitor off this decision to engage. In the very last teamfight, Lotta Mortis tried to go in on TSM's backline but wasn't able to do so. Complexity forced an engagement on TSM's frontline instead, leaving Wild Turtle completely alone. This teamfight would kickstart Wild Turtle's LCS career. 
He's going to be able to find the out. If he goes for the bandage toss, he doesn't really want to waste too much crowd control on that. Laudamore just takes a bit of damage, but they've got positioning now. They could go for this one. Darius is in front. Darius taking very low. Laudamore is still yet to use skills to the side. Mommy, there it is. He goes out. Crescendo hits the entire complexity team, though. Can they turn it around? Wild Turtle out the back, just hitting, hitting one after the other. There's a double kill for him. Laudamore goes in. That's going to feed him a triple kill. MIA strand. That's going to be a quadra kill. Can he get the Penta kill? Brunch you one on one. It's going to be the Penta kill for a beautiful play. Wild Turtle stepping up. Chaos, do you have something to answer right now? Because your replacement is doing a fantastic job. And that is the game for Team Solo Mid. By the end of week seven, Complexity remained in last place at four wins and 14 losses. Some change had to occur in order for Complexity to have a chance to get out of the bottom. Before week eight, Juper stepped down from the mid lane. Prowley would be the starter for the remainder of the season. What Prowley brought to the table was the ability to surprise the opponents with his champion pool. In his LCS debut against CLG, Prowley brought out Ziggs mid, a champion that was not in the competitive meta at the time. In the very beginning of the game, Complexity and CLG had a full engagement at level 1, giving Prowley a great start in the laning phase with a double kill. They are going to be able to go in. It looks like they lock up. The bindings are back and forth, though. They're not focusing the crowd control. Probably is able to get out. It looks like they're able to drop Link first. And oh, someone man. turn this one around here. Complexity still doing the most damage. Almost going down. Hotshot oh. gets out with a sliver. They are still able to take one. Nick Wu falls. MIA coming up with a kill for himself. There's that auto attack range coming into play for the support. And it's going to be a double kill for Prowley. Two assists on his first game as well. Oh my god. That was five kills in the first minute and 20 seconds. Throughout the game, Prowley was able to help out other lanes and secure multiple kills using Mega Inferno Bomb. Prowley's LCS debut ended with a win. In that same week, Prowley pulled out Annie mid against Team Vulcan. Once again, he made very impressive plays on that champion and secured the victory. Prowley continued this string of unconventional mid laners for the remainder of the season. Complexity's gameplay did improve with Prowley's presence, but however, it was too little too late. Complexity ended the season in last place, with 9 wins and 19 losses. One day after their last game in Week 10, Brunchy retires from the team. The reason for his sudden departure is because he no longer enjoys playing League of Legends for a living anymore. He simply does not like the game. Chuper, who originally stepped down in the mid lane, was to replace Brunch in the AD carry position. This roster change was actually reassuring because Chuper was originally an AD carry main before taking up the mid position on the team, so theoretically his performance should have been better than before. Even with this roster change, Complexity Gaming still had a shot of returning to the LCS. The roster performed way better than in the beginning of the split. They were 4 and 14, but after picking up Prolly, they ended the split 5 and 5. Complexity also scored huge victories near the very end of the split against all the veteran teams except for TSM. However, because they ended in last place, they faced off against the strongest team in the summer promotion tournament, Quantic Gaming. This roster consisted of Balls in the top lane, Meteos in the jungle, High in the mid lane, Sneaky Castro as the AD carry, and Lemonation as the support. Complexity Gaming faced off against what would be known as one of the strongest rosters ever in the North American LCS. What Quantic Gaming did to Complexity was nothing short of complete domination throughout the entire series. The roams from each laner and the overall pressure exerted by the entire team was too overwhelming for Complexity to handle. In Game 1, Prowley was shut down by High's performance on Zed, ending laning phase with 3 deaths. Anytime Lotta Mortis tried to exert pressure and start an engagement, Complexity was so behind that the damage wasn't there and Quantic would turn around the fight. They know the Ball's ultimate is down right now, so they're going for Lemon. And they get a bunch of damage there, Cataclysm across, finally that's going to time out. Lemon puts actually the Summoner heal down, Gold Card on Sneaky Castro, and in a 4 versus 2, oh. they've got to run away because Meteor shows up, High's there as well, this could be bad for Prowley, Deathmark picks up the kill, such a good fight for Quantic, and they're still going in on a Rampage, High just kidding, people dead, 5 versus 3 on the map now. Game 3 saw Complexity take an early game lead with a double kill on Quantic's bot lane. However, when Complexity tried to aggro on Quantic, they would be repelled. At Dragon, Complexity forced an initiation but ended up being aced. More damage, red team does pick up Dragon, good job by Meteos, so and now Ladder Mortis is caught out. He ults on, here comes a Crescendo and Equalizer. Probably gonna go in, balls in the middle, taking a lot of damage, Nick Wu in the side as well. Probably getting chased around so low on health, can they trade back and forth? They do, but it's a lot of deaths right now. Nick Wu has fallen over as well, Chuper forced to run away. TF Bolt comes Ooh. by, Chuper flashes, gold card in. He flashes in for that one. Cheaper's not in a good spot. MIA falls down as well. And there is everyone but Louder Mortis. But Louder Mortis says, hey guys, me too. I want to drop. And an ace there. Double wow. kill for Meteos. Quantic, great fight. In Complexity's last ditch effort, they engaged onto Sneaky Castro. However, Quantic was too ahead. 
This could be Complexity having to give up part of their Nexus to defend this outer turret. And maybe they won't go for that. They're going to go in on a Sneaky Castro. But there comes Meteos and a beautiful crescendo. They find Prowly. There's one kill so far. They're going to keep mopping up right now. Balls dives forward. He looks for the four remaining members of Complexity. The ult comes out from high. Gets a stun on the Trooper. Trooper's going to fall over. They're going to keep moving forward. Nick Wu falls down. MIA falls down. This is most certainly going to be the game. This could be Quantic 3-0 going into the LCS Summer Split. Every single game in this series, Quantic wrapped it up in under 28 minutes. Quantic showed complete domination and deserved their spot in the LCS. Complexity Gaming was the first team to be relegated in NALCS history. Unlike other teams, Complexity was still determined to get back into the LCS. Not only did they not immediately disband, but they would try to use the Challenger series as a way to get back in. In June, Nick Wu left Complexity Gaming. The top lane position was taken over by Megazero, who was a free agent after Team Marn was relegated from the LCS. With this roster change, Complexity's offseason showed success. Complexity took first place in the Mobile Fire Challenger series, going 12-1. In PAX Prime of 2013, Complexity obtained a Season 4 promotional tournament seed after defeating Cognitive Gaming. Once again, Complexity was in a prime position to make it back into the LCS. This time around, they had a solidified roster for an entire offseason as well as proven success in the amateur scene. However, on Halloween of 2013, disaster struck the team. Suddenly, Lotta Mortis stepped down from being the starting jungler and the captain of the team. Not only that, but two weeks before the LCS promotion tournament, Prawley left Complexity Gaming. Complexity lost their team captain and their star mid laner before the promotion tournament. The reasons for this sudden departure was due to trauma within the team. In a twin longer by Lotta Mortis one year after his departure, he explained how toxic the team environment was and how he was responsible for it. Lotta Mortis said, I can confirm I was often rude and condescending to our bot lane, and that wasn't right and I wouldn't begrudge them if they wanted to kick me. Acting like that is extremely unfair. Probably confirmed Lotta Mortis' attitude and his reflections with Thorin. Uh, before Lot left for his made up reasons, he was actually being kicked from the team for being an asshole. <laughs> Literally, I never had much of a problem with him. The most that would happen is we'd argue about a play or something like, oh, was this a good call, a bad call? And that's, that's what me and Lot's arguments would be. But for some reason, him and our bot lane had a huge fight every day. Like, there's some kind of, I don't know, passive-aggressive thing that happened between our bot lane and our jungle where a scrim would end and you'd go, oh man, isn't our nice, our bot lane didn't feed her. A scrim would end and you'd go, yeah, like, good job not feeding double buffs. Like, it was always some kind of, like, snide remark. And it ended up with us kicking Lot. And the week we were kicking Lot, we had a huge like debate about our managing staff and he disagreed with us and walked out and we were like I think he's quitting which was kind of a relief to us because then we didn't have to do the oh you know it's not working out talk and that's when we picked up Ninjakin. Overall Automortis felt that in the situation he was in it was no longer worth it to pursue being a professional player. He ended his tweet longer with an apology to Trooper and MIA. I can't take back anything I said while I was on your team, but I really did love playing with you guys before I lost sight of why I loved playing. Prawley's departure was similar to Lotta Mortis. MIA writes in his AMA, Once Lot left, we started to realize something pretty quickly. Prawley had become a really toxic teammate. We didn't notice it before because he mainly argued with Lot, but once Lot was gone, his attention and blaming focused on the other teammates instead. It became so bad that he gave the entire team the silent treatment during our scrims, just one week before the promotion qualifiers. In general, the team found it hard to work with Prawley and his toxicity. Even Brunchu chimed in during the AMA, reaffirming MIA's claim. Prawley explains his side of the story, stating he was kicked for an argument that happened the day before. Prawley states in an interview with Travis Gafford, I was told to leave. About a week before the decision, I had messaged Trooper that I was unhappy with the way the team was acting towards practicing, and I felt very uncomfortable at the prospects of living with them again. I never got a response. Overall, this drama is meaningless today, but it conveyed a significant angle of being a professional gamer that isn't normally exposed. The fact that the job is incredibly stressful, especially when there is not a winning culture present on the team. When success was present, the tensions didn't matter and everyone enjoyed each other's company. However, when losing occurred, all hell broke loose. With no support staff present such as the coach or analysts, arguments would have to be solved with just each other. 
When there is a losing culture present and as long as complexities, a player's drive to maintain their profession starts to deteriorate. League of Legends doesn't stay fun anymore. By spending 8 hours a day playing the game, being in a toxic environment, and underperforming to a team's expectations, it is understandable why the majority of the roster did not seek another team when complexity disbanded the roster. Jinte and Ninja can replace Lotta Mortis and Prolly, but it did not matter since Complexity performed abysmally in the promotion tournament. Complexity released this roster on January 9, 2014. Lotta Mortis, Brunchu, Trooper, and MIA did not compete in the LCS ever since their relegation. Nick Wu had a brief stint on XDG Gaming as their jungler. However, the matches that he was in, XDG lost both games. The original Complexity Gaming roster have since retired from playing professionally. Today, Nick Wu works for Riot, where he is a playtester. As for MIA, after Complexity, he went back to his home in Houston where he did a lot of work for the Houston LGBT gaming community. So it's more about the League of Legends experience, so it used to be about how I can improve their in-game experience, but now I want to just help people who play League of Legends have better lives, and so I want them to come out of the Warworks, come to like a party, a watch party, and meet new people instead. So just different ways I can help people enjoy League of Legends experiences. Today, he also works for Riot as a quality assurance analyst. Jipper has stepped away from playing professionally and now just plays casually, maintaining a rank around high diamond elo. Brunchu has since stepped away from League of Legends completely, deleting all his social media accounts. Lotta Mortis has also stepped away completely. He rarely posts on his Twitter account today. As for Prolly, his story with Complexity Gaming is not over yet. In conclusion, the 2013 Complexity Gaming roster was ill-prepared for the inaugural LCS season. While they performed well in the qualifiers, they could not compare to the level of play the veteran teams displayed at their time. This roster also conveys what happens to a team with a losing culture and zero support staff. These players had their dreams come true in being a professional gamer. However, when the reality of being a professional player dawned on them in a toxic, losing atmosphere, their motivation and drive vanished as fast as the team's relegation in the hands of what would be known as Cloud9. My name is Kudo, and thank you for watching my video on the 2013 Complexity Gaming roster. The next video in this series will be about Complexity Black in the 2014 North American LCS. And I understand the team was previously called She Said She Was Level 18. Can you tell me uh, why you picked that name and what that name is supposed to mean? Um, well, let's start by saying it definitely isn't statutory rape okay. because, I mean, she yeah. definitely wanted it. Okay. She, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, I don't know, we just thought it was a clever name. Yeah. Uh, we didn't really have a lot of good, cool names and we don't have a sponsor, so yeah. it was like, name us whatever we want. And, I mean, that one had the most laughs associated with it, so we rolled with that. It doesn't really have a meaning. We switched it to something a little more PG and a little bit more related, but yeah. a lot less funny.